Hello, BookTube. You're never going to believe this, but I went back to the Brattle Bookshop <laughs> here in Boston. Uh, those of you who are new to the channel, it's a great used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston. And in addition to being a great used bookstore with tons of turnover and a great staff and tons of jam-packed bookshelves, they also have a gigantic sale lot next door. Thousands more books for $1, $3, or $5. And there's no order out there except for the prices. You never know what you're going to find. It, it's an infinite variety. That also changes over a lot. Uh, and it's one of my favorite places to go. I have been going to the Brattle sale lot for a long time, in all weathers. And th this morning, I had to be in the neighborhood of the Brattle anyway. So I was naturally going to walk up the street and go in and see what I could find. And you might think, well, surely you didn't find anything, right? Because no matter how good the Brattle's turnover is, you were just there on Monday uh, or Tuesday. You were, you were just there the other day uh, and got a pile of books. You showed it to the shows. And then just yesterday, you didn't go to the Brattle and you still got a pile of used books in the mail from a sender in England. So surely you didn't find anything at the Brattle today. But no, I did. I found a lot. I found a lot at the Brattle. That is the way of it. You find tons of things. And uh, some of the things that I found were gifts for other people. But even if you take those out, it's still a fairly good pile. So I thought we'd go through it together. Uh, and the first one is of a piece with two things that I found the other day at the Brattle. Kind of the sort of thing that you can expect. You don't ever want to bring expectations to the Brattle sale lot. You don't ever want to go there and say, you must provide me with this. Because the gods are watching, and if you offend serendipity at the Brattle sale lot, you won't get anything. So the other day, when I saw two mass market paperbacks of Dewey Lambden, Alan Lurie, Napoleonic era seafaring adventures, I, saw, I found the King's Coat and the King's Privateer, and I showed them to you, and they had original cover artwork, and I thought, uh, this is interesting. I remembered them because I believed uh, that the Alan Lurie books only had three mass markets in the United States. And then they went to spottily issued trade paperbacks. And I saw the, I got those first two for a dollar a piece, and I thought, well, okay, it's unlikely that anyone sold the Brattle these two mass markets and didn't have the third one. I'm not putting any expectations on the Brattle sale lot, but it would sure be nice if the third one showed up. And there it did, the HMS Cockerel. Uh, with a naval battle right there on the cover. So I believe I now have all of the Alan Lurie books that ever existed in these cute little mass market paperbacks. I think they stopped after this one. And I'm not saying that I need it to be this format. I I uh, would be perfect. I wish that the Alan Luries were all in a completely regular set, like Patrick O'Brien. That would be great if that happened, but I don't think it has. Uh, I'll take these three to start with, absolutely. So now I have all three of them. That was That wasn't out there. Uh, the other day when I went to the Brattle, it, I just had to, it had to come up. It was part of a box probably, and uh, I just had to wait. It's a thing that you have, that you often notice at the Brattle is that if you wait, sets will assemble, but they get broken apart. They get there, they are sets on shelves in the houses where the buy happens. Then they get they get knocked down into boxes. The boxes get put in the basement. The boxes come back up. The boxes get priced and sorted. And then some of the stuff goes out into the sale lot. And you would be amazed just by the Poisson distribution matrix how often those sets will stay together even though there's that many opportunities to break them apart. So I was a part of me was kind of hoping that I would see this. And there it is. Uh, then this next one is a mass market paperback. It's from the UK. Uh, it's an author I don't, I don't particularly know, but it's a thriller. I've had it before. I believe I remember liking it. Uh, so I'm going to try it again. I mean, it was only a dollar. The thing about the Brattle is that the, the, if, you're, if you're shopping out in the sale lot, you really can't hurt yourself by taking chances because you're not going to be out any kind of money. Uh, so I got A Critical Mass by Steve Martini in this uh, UK mass market paperback. Uh, Joss Cole, a burned-out public defender from L.A., has opted for a quieter life in Washington State. Then into her office walks Dean Belden in search of a lawyer to help him get set up a business. Within days, Belden appears before the federal grand jury and just minutes before testifying, he is killed. Meanwhile, Gideon Van Rie, a nuclear fission expert in California, is troubled by the failure to account for two nuclear devices missing from the former Soviet Union. Under a false bill of lading, they were shipped to a company called Belden Electronics. And Gideon's only lead is the lawyer who incorporated Belden Electronics, Joss Cole. I remember, I think I read this book, and I think I kind of liked it. 
Uh, but I knew I knew as soon as I saw it that I don't have it now, so I grabbed it. Uh, probably it's shown up on a library tour here uh, in the distant past. <laughs> probably that is true. But I, I, there have been times in in here at Hyde Cottage where I have decided to just get rid of a lot of mass market paperbacks uh, just to clear room. I almost had that thought just the other day about the block of mass market paperbacks that remains. Aside from my romance novels. I have almost no mass market paperbacks left anymore. And I'm off, I often think, why don't you just get rid of them? Just get rid of the mass markets that you have and wait. The Brattle will provide. Sooner or later, you will see trade paperbacks or hardcovers of these things. Uh, but the more I think about it, every time I'm tempted to do that, I think about things like this. This is what you have that doesn't exist in any other form that I like. Uh, so, so mass markets definitely serve a purpose. Purging them would be a dumb idea. Uh, then we go on to hardcovers. All the rest is hardcovers. And the first one is another book for my bookcase of books about books. My overburdened, crying, crisis-ridden bookcase of books about books. And not only is this another book for that, but it's a, it's a duplicate in a way. This is The Lantern Bearers and Other Essays by Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, this is edited uh, by Jeremy Tregong, who was uh, editor for the uh, TLS. And he selects... Uh, Stevenson essays here. So this is not complete. It could have been longer. I remember thinking that at the time that it came out. This came out in the 80s, I think. Uh, 1988. And in his introduction, Tregon says, you know, I, I love this, that, or the other Stevenson essay. It's a shame it wouldn't fit. And I'm looking at this thing and thinking it's as skinny as Stevenson was. So it could fit. You could have made this bigger. But I love the elegance of these choices. I love the introduction. He has a line in the introduction. I wonder if I'll be able to find it. Uh, yeah, there he is. Be between the high rigor of Thomas Carlyle and uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay and the brilliant but ultimately arid playfulness of Oscar Wilde, a unique voice is heard in Stevenson, both moral and irre irreverent, subjective and socially aware, keen to draw conclusions, yet always conscious of relativism and the unreliability of dogma. That is very, very good. And I'm always, I'll, I'll always take, this This is a volume that uh, I loved. Once upon a time, I had a trade paperback of this. I, I love the selections. I love the introduction. I even love the John Singer Sargent painting on the cover that really shows uh, what everybody said about Stevenson when, in his own day, when people would meet him. They knew already it was fairly well known that he was consumptive, that he had, that he had consumption. And, and people would go to visit him, you know, as a famous author and a very gregarious, very, a very friendly author, a welcoming author. Uh, people would go to visit him thinking, well, you know, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see a consumptive. And instead, they universally came back saying, consumption or no consumption, he never stopped smoking. It's, it's amazing that he's still alive at all, consumption or no consumption, considering how much he smokes. Uh, and uh, the whole package here, that portrait plus these selections, this is a wonderful volume. And I remember when I had my trade paperback, I read it until it, the, the binding broke and fell apart, pages were coming out like feathers off a bird. And I remember thinking, boy, it'd be nice to find a hardcover of this, of this exact collection of Stevenson essays. And here it is. So uh, I, I got that paperback at an old used bookstore called the Boston Book Annex. Uh, that was right on my route for years. It was perfectly situated for years. It was a great place, except it had a very friendly cat. I, I, if, I, if I wanted to sit and contemplate the books, the cat would invariably join me <laughs> and didn't seem to care uh, that, <laughs> that I must have smelled like dogs. Uh, one way or another, very happy to find a hardcover of this, even if I don't technically have a home for it. <laughs> well, I, I have to deal with that bookcase eventually. I com I've complained about it in 10 videos. I haven't, I haven't actually walked over and rolled up my sleeves and dealt with it or tried to. I'm afraid of it. <laughs> uh, the next one is a uh, biography, big fat biography, something that I've had before. Didn't write about it, I don't think. Uh, but I noticed just the other day, uh, I, I was sitting in my easy chair uh, having a, a bowl of rice, a delicious bowl of rice. And I looked across the room, and directly across the room from, from the easy chair, just six feet away, is my uh, one of my two biography bookcases. And the top half of that, that second biography bookcase is all American presidents. 
And I was looking at it, I was seeing, you know, Nigel Hamilton, three volumes on FDR. I was seeing, I'm looking at it now, two volumes, Pringles, two volumes on William Hart Taft. I have a couple of uh, Flexner volumes on Washington. And I have uh, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt and Theodore Rex, two volumes in, in Edmund Morris's trilogy about Theodore Roosevelt. And I, I noticed just the other day that I don't have the third volume. And I don't quite know why. These are beautifully made books, heavily bound, black and white photos inset on many, many of the pages rather than a cheap, you know, uh, island of insets in the middle. And Morris is bril brilliant prose. I don't always agree with him, but he's a beautiful writer. And I think the rationale I had to get rid of it was that it's not a presidential biography. It, the, the third book in that trilogy, Colonel, the Colonel uh, Roosevelt, is about uh, Roosevelt's time out, out of office after his presidency. And that's just crazy. It is, it is an absolutely indispensable trilogy of American biography writing. So I found Colonel Roosevelt, you know, I, I, for cheap out in the, in the sale lot, and I will just make room. Although, once again, just like with the books about books, that half bookcase about American presidents is now crammed past its capacity. And who knows how many American president books are coming out this year. They probably won't show up until the autumn, but there'll probably be at least half a dozen of them. I'll probably want most of them. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I got this. This is actually very good. Even though, uh, talk about disagree, by the time you get to a third biography in a trilogy, you are almost certainly going to be suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. You are going to have all of the sympathies, dispositions, and prejudices of your subject. You're going to defend them against all comers. And I remember from reading this book when it was new, uh, that that definitely applies to Morris, and it, the main focus of that is William Howard Taft, the man who beat Roosevelt to be president, a former friend, as Roosevelt put it, and as Morris certainly thinks it, Morris takes up his cause. So the first, if I remember correctly, the first hundred pages of this book have quite a bit of gratuitous vilifying of William Howard Taft. I'll take it anyway. Uh, then this next one is uh, something that I haven't read, and I don't know how. It is a massive, massive gap uh, that I need to fill right away. Uh, it's a hardcover. It's by Saul David, and it's called Victorious Wars, The Rise of Empire. And it is a big history of, uh, it has this little thing on the thing that, to tell me that it's signed. Is, is that actually true? Oh, very nice. Look at that. Very nice. Full color uh, plate there. Uh, full color end papers. Is this, is this actually signed? Yes, it is. Not much of a signature, but I mean, yes, it is. Interesting. Uh, okay. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> Look at this. All right, well, Sick Transit Gloria Monday. Somebody wrote on the inside here uh, uh, from 2008. I, Abe, maybe for Abe Books, uh, signed $50. <laughs> I did not pay $50 for this, and I would not have paid $50 for it. But... Uh, this is, I believe I know this author. I believe I've read at least one of his works. Uh, yes, Prince of Pleasure, the, the Prince of Wales and the Making of, of the Regency. Oh, oh, okay, also he wrote a book on the Zulu War and also on the Indian Mutiny. I've read all of those. I knew that I knew this name. He, he does reviews a lot, too. But I've never read this book. And this is a book about a subject that interests me greatly. The, the wars of the... the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, the wars that made Victoria's England into the greatest empire in the history of the world. Uh, those wars, they're iniquitous, but they are fascinating reading. And this guy really knows how to tell that kind of a story. He, he gives you all the big personalities. He has a great ear for quotations. He gives you the evil people and the people you can root for. He tells all sides of the story. I can't believe I haven't read this. Uh, I'm just now noticing that... Uh, Something needs to be off about the cover. Jason Harrigan would probably know the technical detail for this. I don't know if you're going to be able to make it out. See that? The the embossing for the letter is different from the coloring. It's off by just a bit. There's got to be a technical term for that. Where the thing just stamped wrong. Uh, one way or another. Uh, it's a, a major meaty work of history that I haven't read. Now this next one is a major meaty work of history. And I have read it. But I haven't, I haven't owned it ever. And I want to because I'm definitely going to want to reread it. This is Stephen Hayward, and this is The Age of Reagan. Great big thing. Big, great big thumping thing. Uh, all about, I mean, it's it's the, the second half of the 20th century. 
but the real focus, the real, the the author really bears down on everything after the time of choosing speech uh, that Reagan gave, allegedly on behalf of Barry Goldwater, but really to start his own political career. Really, it takes you from that speech, which I, for all I know, that speech is on YouTube, and it is uh, like like Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech. It is a speech that changed history to a certain degree in a way. So if you're an American, you really ought to see it. If, if, it's, if it's on YouTube, you really ought to watch that time of choosing speech. But one way or another, the real, the real bearing down here is uh, the political career of Ronald Reagan. So you get all sorts of, of a great, enormous, sprawling cast of secondary characters, including Boston's own Tip O'Neill, who, if I remember correctly from reading this the first time, has a good deal of the limelight as the example of a kind of old ward politician, someone who was corrupt up to his eyeballs, but who still managed to work for his people. And when, once he became Speaker of the House for the whole country, it was a balancing act that that those old uh, stogie chomping backroom politicians uh, used to strike. A lot, the good ones used to strike that. The Quinn the quintessential example in modern era is the legendary Boston Mayor James Michael Curley. Uh, Tip O'Neill could tell great stories about Curley and his era. Uh, Tip O'Neill could tell great stories just in general. He was, uh, in in some ways, a poisonous individual, but also uh, I, I shouldn't I shouldn't make it sound like he is the subject of this book. You have all sorts of other people too, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and and all all kinds of big fascinating figures uh and it's told really well so i was happy to get it especially for dirt cheap <laughs> well, this next one is a sequel i have read one book by this woman but it's not this one and i'm i'm really kind of hoping that that if this one showed up at the brattle her famous book will show up at the brattle uh this is by eugenie clark this is uh the lady and the sharks and as you can see it's a it's her account of her time as the country's most famous ichthyologist studying sharks in Florida uh, and learning a lot about them uh, breaking a lot of ground about them just hands-on learning into in in a lot of cases because as you can see she was a uh, one of the foremost modern pioneers of doing uh, oceanic ocean oceanographic research by scuba diving by going and seeing things by collecting things personally no bathysphere no no nothing like that uh this this book is her follow-up she did a book called uh lady with a spear about her time on the red sea coast of egypt and it was utterly fascinating just utterly fascinating a classic sold really well too uh and it made her it made her her career it made her name as a kind of popular writer someone who's a, a scientist who could write a great narrative story and i knew that i read lady with the spirit and loved it and would really like to have a copy and i knew that she wrote a follow-up i knew that she wrote another book back once once she was established as a major shark expert and was popularly known as the shark lady i knew that she wrote a book and i think i remembered the lady and the sharks was the was the title of it but i'd never even seen it in all this time, this, I mean, this came out in the 60s, I think, or maybe in maybe the late 70s. 1969. This came out in 1969. All that time, I've only known about it and have not actually had a copy. So this is a, a ga another gap to be filled. It's a, a, a great interest to read this. And maybe whoever had this had Lady with a Spear, and it will show up at the Brattle. The only thing that I think is going to be hard about reading this book is that uh, it was the research methods of the day. And that included a lot of gratuitous killing of the animals under study. Uh, now, uh, uh, she didn't agree with that. Uh, that's a gigantic tiger shark. Look at the size of that thing. She didn't largely agree with that and, uh, and didn't always do it and championed not doing it. She, she was a, 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 an eloquent and forceful conservationist. So I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. You know, it is it is 70 years ago. So I just I just noticed this picture. This is uh, the author's dogs uh, at, uh, on the rocks among the tidal pools outside our new home on Siesta Key, where I've been. I've been to Siesta Key. It is beautiful. All the keys are beautiful. But I'm noticing 
the kids have a German Shepherd puppy and what looks a lot like a miniature Schnauzer. <laughs> I'm going to have to see in the book if that is the case. But there is our author as a young woman. Uh, and the, I, this is just a, a joy. It's the kind of thing that you find at the Brattle, out on the sale lots for a dollar. That where you can you you're overjoyed. You have no idea how it got there. It's not in any predictable order, and you get to just take a chance. Now in this case, it's not much of a chance, uh, because Lady with the Spear was really good. So this is probably going to be more of the same. And then we'll finish up with a book that I actually had to reinforce before I could even show it to you. I barely got it back here in one piece. The book, of course, is fine. It's a hardcover. So the book itself is fine, but the dust jacket, I've never seen a, a copy for sale at a reasonable price at the Brattle or anywhere else of this with a dust jacket. I've seen it and owned it many times in a naked hardcover without the dust jacket. But I found it with the dust jacket, but the dust jacket wasn't long for this Earl. I, I had to be very careful getting it back here and then I reinforced it. Uh, and it's this, it's Captain from Connecticut by C.S. Forster. Uh, this, this great dorky original artwork. This is, this is uh, the from when it first came out. Yeah, this is 1941. Uh, and this is, uh, 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 it's not a Hornblower novel. It's by C.S. Forster, the creator of Horatio Hornblower. But it's a novel about a captain, I think, named Peabody, and it's set in the War of 1812. I remember, uh, I haven't read this in forever, not in a million years. It would be a great pleasure to read it again. Uh, I seem to remember that it has, that it follows a pattern that old, old school fans of the Hornblower novels might remember, which is that there is a battle at the beginning of the book, near the beginning, and it's good. And then at the climax of the book, there is a gigantic, incredible battle scene that dwarfs the earlier one. I remember that being the pattern with this book. So it's, it's a Hornblower novel. I haven't read it in forever. It's going to be a huge treat. Uh, Mark Richardson and I are currently reviving Two If By Sea. We're reading Patrick O'Brien, so I'm in the mood for nautical fiction. So this Brattle Hall uh, starts and finishes with nautical fiction, although uh, Hornblower's heroes would not have wanted anything to do with Alan Lurie <laughs> and would probably have, or have reported him to the Port Admiral or whatever. But one way or another, uh, that ends the, the Brattle Hall on a high note because I'm, it's going to be a joy to reread this thing. Uh, so we'll do a Steve Pyramid here. We have The Captain from Connecticut, a C.S. Forster novel that, of course, had me irate. Of course it did. There is no full-dress, 800-page popular biography of C.S. Forster. As far as I know, there's never been one. That is a crime. Considering that we get six Napoleon biographies every year, that's a crime. There's never been a biography of this guy. Uh, and then we have The Lady with the Sharks. There's never been a, a biography of, of, of Jeannie Clark. Never. There's ample material. There's never been a biography. There's never been a better time for it. She was a pioneer in her field. She was a woman. She was extremely intelligent. Her letters are in an archive, unconsulted, sitting moldering in boxes. There's tons and tons of photographic plates that no one's bothered to use. A biography could be written. It would be fascinating. A lady that, that taught us all a lot about sharks. Is there such a biography? No. 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 There's not. Uh, then we have the Age of Reagan. Now here we are well acquainted. We are well acquitted, right? Because Daniel Patrick Moynihan has a great biography, The Gentleman from New York, and also a great collection of letters. Uh, Tip O'Neill wrote a really good book of his own, uh, uh, but also had a really good biography written of him uh, called Man of the House. Uh, so and Ronald Reagan, of course, is not has not lacked for biographies. Then we have Saul David, Victoria's Little Wars. <laughs> uh, I, I, a major gap that I'm going to need to fix. Uh, then we have Colonel Roosevelt by, Des uh, by Edmund Morris, uh, the third volume in his trilogy of books about Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, then we have uh, The Lantern Bears, a, a collection of essays by Robert Louis Stevenson. Once again, we have uh, uh, some gaps here. The, William Howard Taft is a major character in a lot of Colonel Roosevelt. William Howard Taft does not have a totally accessible 800 page modern biography robert louis stevenson is the subject of this collection of essays but is there a nice big fat complete essays of robert louis stevenson no and as tregelon makes clear in his introduction to this book there aren't even standard editions of his novels one of the most popular novelists in the modern era because people don't take him seriously so there aren't even standardized editorial protocols for him after all this time uh but anyway then we have uh critical mass by steve martini 
uh, and HMS Cockerel by Dewey Landon. So a nice, nice big Brattle haul. I don't think I will be going back to the Brattle uh, tomorrow. <laughs> I don't think I will be. Pretty sure that's it for this week. Uh, but one way or another, it was it was great fun. And of course, it's, it adds to the fun that I get to share all these things with you. So thank you once again. I thank you all the time anyway. But thank you once again for being there. It's so much fun to chat about these things. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.